Good afternoon and welcome to the eighth forum in the 2021 edition of the Institute of Policy Studies flagship Singapore Perspectives Conference, the theme of which is Reset. My name is Julian and I'm deeply privileged to be able to chair this session where we'll discuss the role of values and qualities of leadership in how we reset Singapore to thrive in the year 2030. This is the third of four days of a conference and this third day is organized around our national pledge to build a democratic society. This is in the light of the disruptions that have been brought on by the current COVID-19 global pandemic, as well as other major interrelated shifts in geopolitics, technology, economics, ecology, the social mood and governance that preceded the pandemic, if you cast your mind back to 2018 and 2019. Those of you who have been following this series know that our thought leaders have provided us with a flavor of the different trajectories uh, the future of our country, Singapore, can take. In light of the different trajectories the globe in all those domains I cited can take. After all, we stand only a day away from a change in administration in the United States of America, from the presidency of Donald Trump to that of Joe Biden. And with it, hope, as well as deep antipathy in that internally divided superpower around the prospect of sweeping changes in leadership, policies, and state action that it will mean. In Singapore, the fourth generation of leaders from the ruling People's Action Party have more gently moved into position over the past two years. And along with that, we've seen leadership renewal in the ranks of the political opposition as well. These leaders are building up their sinews for decision-making in a period of radical uncertainty. As much as citizens are trying to gauge how much these leaders care for them and are attuned to their needs and concerns, and therefore citizens deciding how much to trust them and work with them to craft Singapore's future. Truth be told, there cannot be a time since World War II or the Cold War when values and the technical quality of leadership has been more critical, be it in government, in business, in the scientific community, in national and international civil society. We simply cannot afford a deficit of leadership. A point so clearly made in our session this morning titled Multilateralism and Global Cooperation. So what are the questions for this session? Well, first, what sorts of leaders, national and international, might the global trends I cited earlier throw up? Or if you think that that question seems so passive and fatalistic an approach, a different question for us to tackle might be, what sorts of leaders in government, business, the scientific and technological community and society will we need across the globe and certainly in Singapore to interpret the trends, to make the decisions that will benefit long-term human development, the greatest level of happiness for the greatest number of people in the decade and, belong, and beyond. So if you prefer this second question, then the question to that question is, what sorts of legal, ethical, and governance frameworks are these leaders likely to be confronted by? Will they need to address or even boldly reshape in order to achieve positive human development? And since we're coming to you in Singapore, which is a small city state, I think it's difficult to talk about achieving happiness, prosperity, and progress without talking about our immediate region and the challenges that the planet is going through. So this local regional global nexus is really something that we have to be very conscious of when we speak of leadership. And for those of you who live through it, you know that disruption can be quite precipitous as was well the global financial meltdown in 2008. Or disruption can be gradual and subtle and then past the tipping point it can be chronic and extreme, like climate change and resource depletion, where the threat to human habitats in Southeast Asia, of which Singapore is but a small island state, can really leave us with a, an unthinkable sinking feeling. 
Or if a people group feels marginalized or misunderstood, they can be ra radicalized and take the wrecking ball to economic, financial, social, political systems that the rest of us have taken for granted for so long. Our way of life can be blown away before our very eyes. Uh, I hope you don't think I'm being hyperbolic because this is actually what has taken over in the past. And I think we can do no better than to remember what Professor Jar Diamond said this morning, that like with COVID-19, in many of these issues, no country is safe till the world is safe. No country is safe, except if we have the leadership that we need, not just in Singapore, but the rest of the world. Okay, we will not dare to be so ambitious in setting out the agenda for this afternoon, except that we have four very forceful, experienced, incredible thought leaders before us, and they will rise to the challenge in delivering their points of view over the next few minutes. Let me introduce them in the order that they are addressing you. Uh, it's important because they are all leaders in their own right. First, we have Ambassador at Large and Professor Chan Heng Chi, who is the chairperson of the Lee Kuan Yew uh, Center for Innovative Cities in the Singapore University of Technology and Design. But many of you will recognize her as the doyen of the study of political science in Singapore's intellectual circles and globally, but also the doyen of the diplomatic corps when she was Singapore's representative in the United States between 1996 and 2012. Of course, she served with distinction as permanent resident uh, re representative to the United Nations, High Commissioner to Canada and Mexico to, uh, uh, for Singapore. She's received the inaugural Asia Society Outstanding Diplomatic Achievement Award, the inaugural Foreign Policy Outstanding Diplomatic Achievement Award, and the United States Navy Distinguished Public Service Award for her efforts. She's currently the global co-chair of Asia Society, which is a leading non-profit organization that seeks to build ties between Asia and America. So that's Professor Chan Chi, and good afternoon to you, Professor Chan. Thank you, Gillian. Gosh, Gillian, I don't know if I can give you remarks that will match the build up that you gave me, but thank you very much. Right. Now, we are asked to think about the values and qualities of leaders we need in the future, in 2030 to be exact. Let me begin by asking you to backcast 10 years ago when it was 2011. It is useful because you can see how much has changed and also how little has changed in 10 years. In 2011, our politics was verging on populist and the results of the GE was a minor political earthquake in Singapore. I say populist because some of the issues were about jobs, immigration, elitism, the poor and the old, and those left behind. There was a strong desire to see a bigger opposition presence in parliament. The Workers' Party won their first GRC, our junior. The PAP lost three ministers in one slate. It was sobering for the party. They did a reset, listened to the ground and brought in the right policies, social and economic. And in 2015, recaptured lost ground. Now think GE 2020, some issues were the same jobs, fear of the loss of jobs, immigration, to have more diverse voices in parliament. New issues and concerns were emerging too. The government handling of COVID, efficient government, fairness of government. Things change, but things are the same. 10 years ago, where were we in the world? The United States was just coming out of the global financial crisis. We saw the beginning of a pushback by the United States when they realized China had been more assertive and gaining influence and ground when they were in a funk. Today, US-China relations have never been at such a low point. 10 years ago, we were already talking of black swans and we were preparing ourselves for the VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. The world took VUCA seriously, watching the collapse of the Soviet Union. For Singapore, we began grappling with and trying to imagine VUCA, technological disruption and the future of work. How not to be left behind. 
Then COVID-19 happened. It was different. It was a wake up call. It was deeply and widely felt. COVID was a VUCA moment that brought home the uncertainty, volatility, and ambiguity. Worldwide, we had an ice bucket shower. What came out clearly in this pandemic is that leadership matters. Think of the countries that did not have good leadership, wafflers and science deniers, and those who politicized science. Leadership was the crucial ingredient. It was not about having the most resources, technology or medical equipment. It was how leadership communicated the crisis, responded with policy and mobilized and organized and protected its people. If leadership is so crucial in a VUCA crisis, how do you go about getting good leadership? What sorts of leaders are we looking for? What qualities should they have? Can they be nurtured? And can they be prepared for the testing moment? Should it be a strong man or a collective leadership? In an interview with the McKinsey Global Institute in December 2020, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong was asked what good leadership would look like in the next normal. He talked of good leadership as a team working together, building trust, but the leader must be prepared to use talent. But for me, the most interesting thing he said about leadership was, and I quote, you must be prepared for surprises and setbacks. You can do the right thing. You can make the right decision, but things can easily turn out differently and you have to be prepared for it psychologically. Well, you've made the best bet. It didn't work. Let's play the cards where they are. Think about what he said, spoken from experience as a leader of the country. Good advice. You will be surprised. There are setbacks. You've done your best, but you must move on and do the best you can to recover. Now, I would add three other qualities to leadership in a discussion on this topic. As Gillian says, I'm someone who has watched politics in Singapore for decades, and I speak as a citizen. I will not talk about the obvious qualities, such as charisma, skills in communication, ability to connect with people. It is obvious good leadership, successful leadership, must have the right amount of such qualities. So let me talk of the first point. In the next decade, the world and the region will undergo great changes brought on by great power rivalry and by the COVID pandemic. There will be restructuring. We see countries emerging and countries slipping behind because policies have not kept up and because of incompetent government. In Singapore, the level of competence of government is high and we should do our best to maintain that. The quality I would like to see in leaders, our leaders, is the ability to hold, to be bold, and seek to instill a culture of daring to try, to push us so that we will not slip behind. Many of us in Singapore have talked about our shortcomings of complacency and kiasuism. I have a story which illustrates our character brilliantly. A foreign architect told me that he noticed one difference between Singapore and Dubai. When he shows his plans to his Singapore clients of a very innovative and unusual structure, he would be asked, has this been built before? How many times? Three times? Four times? Good, we'll do it. In Dubai, if the plans were shown to his Emirati clients, they would ask, has this been built before? If the answer is yes, they are not interested. They want something that is totally new and never been built before. Now I understand we in Singapore do not want to be reckless, but we can be over cautious. Yes, it is hard to try something new when we have used one playbook over the years and have been successful going along with it. It is hard to let go of what works, even though you know it won't last much longer and change is necessary. I think business people have the same problem. 
not just political leaders. Uh, we, when a business strategy or model has worked for a long time, why would you change it until you run into real trouble? Some degree of risk-taking is a necessary quality to be innovative and relevant and to be ready for the political landscape of the future. The second point I want to make, the leadership circle, I think, should reflect the diversity of the population and understand the evolving diversity. This is a quality of qualities crucial for leadership everywhere. But in multiracial Singapore, this is at the heart of politics and society. Globally, identity politics has become more salient. In the US, it has become rancorous and highly divisive. A few days ago, in a session on identities and cohesion, Ambassador Alami Musa discussed diversity in identities and in the increasing complexity of the diversity. He beat me to it by raising the importance of the issue. But from my point of view, it is what leaders should understand fully and grasp. It requires empathy and insight. It is not just about racial diversity, which we are familiar with in Singapore, CMIO. And even with racial diversity, it is getting more complex and interracial and transnational marriages abound and hyphenated identities, which Dr. Sharon Siddiqui and I discussed in our book, Singapore's Multiculturalism. It is about gender diversity. First raised when Singapore was self-autonomous in the 1950s. Then we only talked about women's issues. Gender diversity continues to be important though it has taken new forms. It is not only about equality of opportunity for jobs. Women want to sit on corporate boards or see more women in politics and in political office. Our proportion of women in parliament is 29.5% after the 2020 elections. Highest percentage so far. By the way, Britain's is 34% in parliament by way of comparison. Actually, women in Singapore are doing increasingly better in politics and in political office. In recent years, LGBTQ has emerged as a significant gender diversity issue because it is about the legitimacy of status and rights of those who identify themselves as LGBTQ. It is not an easy issue for Singapore as we are a conservative society with segments of the population who have difficulty accepting this. The question is whether leadership in the next decade should lead society on this issue and point to a progressive outcome or be led by society, waiting for society to change. On diversity, I believe leaders now have to pay greater attention to what the younger demographics in our society are saying and reaching for. They should listen and raise the concerns or point out the misconceptions. Many have been in universities, in Singapore and overseas. Our politicians have been good in promoting the Great Singapore Conversation and more recently initiating the Singapore Together Movement with the people to discuss and design policies for community level partnerships. Our leaders learn that climate change is an issue that resonates with the young. It is also an issue that people at the top here our leaders consider an essential one, an existential one for Singapore. Now, if you go into Instagram today, young people are discussing serious social, social issues like anti-racism, racial justice, and social justice. Instagram used to be about lifestyle. You will see 10 picture frames of food, social gatherings, and fashion. These days, there are serious discussions about gender inequality, racial inequality, and inequality regarding migrant workers. Now, this may explain the explosion of heated views and reaction to Chinese privilege 
which was discussed in the identities session and trending on social media. Allow me to digress and say something about Chinese privilege. Minorities feel there is Chinese privilege because they encounter racism and prejudice in Singapore and institutional racism. I understand why they say that. We need to keep working hard to eradicate racism. But I want to provide the perspective that actually a segment of the Chinese population in Singapore disagree that there is such a thing as Chinese privilege. They remember that at the birth of our nation, the Chinese community was told by Lee Kuan Yew that they should set aside their claims for majoritarianism and accept that Chinese would not be the national language, even though they were the overwhelming majority population. Then in the 1980s, Nanyang University was merged with the University of Singapore. That was how NUS came to be. This episode was painful for the Chinese educated community. They were asked to attend classes in NUS in English, a language they were not equipped to handle at the tertiary level. Many dropped out. They were angry and unhappy with the government. So perhaps Chinese privilege is not as appropriate to use in Singapore given their history. Our social scientists, as Daniel Goh points out, have come up with other terms to describe our situation of racial inequality. Now, let me turn to point number three. Oh, don't troll me, please. Point number three. I believe future leadership must be intergenerational, a combination of generations in the leadership circle. We are in the era of the young leader. Although, you know, if you look at the United States, the US has made this an era of older leaders. You know, uh, Justin Trudeau became PM at the age of 43. He's 49 today. France elected Emmanuel Macron at 39. He's 43 today. And just Cinder Ardern, Prime Minister of New Zealand, took office at 37. She's 40 today. When Prime Minister Lee said he was determined to plan succession and step down at 70, I thought he should not. But PM was aware of the trends out there then. And our younger population is articulate with strong opinions, especially those who have received tertiary education. Increasingly, they form a good two thirds of the working population. They are our PMEDs. They are digitally empowered and have expectations. But leadership should be intergenerational because in Singapore, we face an aging electorate and an aging workforce. It is essential to have all segments reflected to ensure a good understanding of the aging issues. In our recent election, we saw candidates who were in their 50s and 60s and an 80 year old fielded by the opposition parties. The PAP's youngest of the new candidates was 30 years old and the oldest was 50. It was remarked upon so remarkable was his showing up on the ticket. That is because the PAP emphasized fielding younger candidates in past elections. Now going forward, I think the ruling party is likely to go intergenerational too in their choice of candidates. Now Jillian asked, and this is by way of conclusion, how we can help leaders make better decisions. There is a good old, there is the good old scenario planning exercise that government bureaucracies play with. And this morning, we heard about the Finns and how they were very good at gaming and playing scenarios and getting prepared and leadership must be prepared. This helps leaders to anticipate problems. They can game situations and work out how they will react. But I think that only does so much. In the end, it is the character and personality of the people in charge which will decide how they act. Then there is a sandbox approach of experimenting with a solution to see how it works before implementing on a larger scale. I have referred to our non-NMPs and NCMPs as sandboxes for the PAP government 
to try out how to handle the opposition, especially in debate. China used SEZs to try out liberalizing the economy and experimenting with capitalism. They opened up Shenzhen, Shuhai, Shandong, Shantou, and Xiamen. But I think in the end, what is important is that leaders must want to lead. They must possess the passion and conviction to lead and a vision they want to implement. Thank you. Thank you, Prof Chan, for your uh, strong opening. I think we have good footing for uh, the ongoing conversation on values and qualities of leadership. You mm. said that uh, you feel leaders have to be prepared to recognize the cards that they're given and to play them. And if things go wrong, prepared to recover. And uh, you talked about, therefore, um, yeah, the value of scenario planning, but really that uh, there should be an ongoing process using sandboxes to uh, um, think innovatively and be prepared for the unthinkable. Um, and you said that it is somewhat down to character and personality of the leaders. Uh, but on top of that, I think there are three key points that you made uh, that uh, leaders must have the ability to um, uh, instill in the people they lead as well, uh, the uh, culture of daring to do. So they must do it themselves. And as they do that, lead the others, give license to the others to do that. Secondly, you felt that especially in Singapore, leaders have to reflect the diversity that you find in multicultural Singapore. And then the third point, which is also itself about diversity, that leadership in Singapore has to be intergenerational. So thank you for that great opening. And we'd like to now uh, give the floor to Professor Margaret Heffernan. Let me say a few words about her. She's a dear friend of Singapore, has visited many times, uh, but is herself a very, uh, is a global thought leader in the area of management and leadership. Professor Hefnan is Professor of Practice <clears throat> at the University of Bath and is lead faculty for the Forward Institute's Responsible Leadership Program. She is the author of very many well-received books. And let me just name two because they're especially relevant for our conversation today. First, her most recent book called Uncharted, How to Map the Future, which was published in 2020, last year. It's a treatise on the merits of strategic thinking for leaders. The second book, Willful Blindness, published in 2012. Willful Blindness, Why We Ignore the Obvious at Our Peril. This book was named by the Financial Times as one of the most important business books of the decade. Uh, it was an appeal for leaders to have the force of courage to do what is right in their strategic organizational decisions to avoid disasters, collapse, and even sometimes uh, crimes against humanity, because such is their sphere of influence. Professor Hefnan is a mentor to many CEOs and senior executives of major organizations around the world through Merrick and Company. She holds an honorary doctorate from the University of Bath and she is speaking to us from Bath this um, morning for her. So good morning again, Professor Hefnan, and it's over to you. You have 15 minutes on this very important topic of values and qualities of leaders. Thank you very much, Gillian, and uh, welcome to everybody watching at the moment. In 2016, after years of debate and stalemates, the Irish government decided to hold a citizens assembly to decide what to be done about the law regarding abortion. The topic was a hot potato in Ireland. No political party wanted to touch it. And Prime Minister Enda Kenny was widely mocked for kicking the can down the road. What's the point of a leader who can't make his own decisions? What good could a bunch of barmen, parents, electricians, nurses, and truck drivers do that an elected, par elected parliament couldn't? 99 participants were recruited who roughly represented the nation's population. They signed up to work for 12 weekends over a period of 18 months to listen to a series of presentations by lawyers, academics, doctors, and ordinary people to advise the government whether or not to hold a referendum. Few had any idea just how much work would be involved. They were welcomed by the prime minister who said this, 
We choose to go about our business this way so that as a nation and as a society, we can move from a position of contention, even of contempt, and find invaluable consensus, some common coordinates in a matter so privately and publicly tender. Key words, contention, contempt, consensus, common coordinates. The government went to enormous lengths to make the exercise as transparent as possible. Every single presentation was streamed online. Every briefing paper was stripped of jargon and published in English, Irish, and Braille. No lobbying organizations or pressure groups could present, but those with lived experience or non-aligned expertise did. A mass exercise in public education, 13,000 submissions were made by the public. On the 23rd of April in 2017, the assembly voted 64% in favor of a referendum proposing the liberalization of abortion up to 12 weeks. The perceived wisdom in political classes was that this was so far from public opinion as to be useless. And media headlines agreed asking how so extreme a view could be watered down to make it palatable to the population. On the 25th of May, 2018, in an almost perfect mirror image of the assembly, the electorate of Ireland voted 66% in favor of liberalization. Of course, those who had argued for liberalization for years were thrilled, but I don't think that's the really important part of this story. What mattered most, what was remarkable, was that even those who did not like the outcome of this decision, accepted its legitimacy. And where citizens who had previously shown contempt for their government, now they felt pride in the way that it had healed such a long seeping wound. This had not been an abnegation of leadership after all, but the essence of it. So what are the lessons to be learned here? The process embodied the belief that everybody matters, that it wasn't the loudest or the richest or the oldest or the most powerful that decided. The desire for consensus was not abandoned, it's just too hard or bound to be too weak. It was embraced as an achievable goal. In other words, it expressed trust in citizens, their capacity to work, to think, to understand, and to listen. And that trust was repaid. The process also reflected a belief that leadership is and must be a constantly evolving experiment, that respect for tradition and institutions need not block the capacity to change. I'd even go further and say that it acknowledged that as the world was changing, so the government now had to do something different, both to reflect that change and to understand it better but this was not a thoughtless rush to play with a new toy. It was a highly meticulous, rigorous exercise designed to ensure that the widest range of voices were heard so that instead of recycling and, and amplifying bias and prejudice, people had what they needed to think for themselves. The quality of leadership that Enda Kenny showed was not about solving the problem, but knowing the process that would, and not being afraid of the experiment. He did not try to impose certainty where there was none. We talk a lot about leadership these days. When things don't work, it's a failure of leadership. And when they do work, it shows that leadership really counts. I often think that it's rather like education. It is both the cause and the solution to, of all our woes. But as we try to imagine the future, this capacity to respect citizens, to treat them as capable adults, seems to me a fundamental quality. When I talked to the barmen and plumbers and parents and technicians who took part in the, the assembly, it was clear to me how seriously they had taken their task and how much they, and indeed the entire population of Ireland, had learned from the trustworthy information they'd been given. As every parent learns, treating children like children tends to keep them that way 
treating them as adults is how they grow. Moreover, the experience com communicated two things that are crucial to leadership. It imbued each participant with a sense of personal responsibility for those other than themselves. As one of them said to me, I suddenly realized it wasn't me that would be affected by that law. I've had my kids already, but I had to think about other people and other lives. And it made people think about the impact of their decision on the future beyond the immediate to the consequences for their children and their children's children and their society. Everyone who took part felt that responsibility. They were a little intimidated by it, but they knew they could not set it aside. And those I think are essential qualities for leadership today. The capacity for humility, it isn't just about me or those like me, and it isn't just about now. I take responsibility for the long-term consequences of my decision. This isn't new, but we've definitely seen around the world that in many cases it has been forgotten. What was new was a serious creative collaboration between citizens and their government. This went far beyond data collection, surveys, polling, focus groups. It acknowledged that in face-to-face -face discussion and lived experiences of others, that we could change our perspectives. And this might sound really obvious, and perhaps it should be obvious, but over the past decade, I think we've seen a dangerous belief that has gained traction to the effect that we can't really learn from each other, we're all so biased and we're so self-centered, we're so polarized and wedded to our own beliefs, there's no point trying to talk to each other. We're just condemned to isolation in our own bubbles of belief. But this isn't true. Another beautiful experiment that started in Germany and has spread around the world has shown this. Jochen Wegener of Die Zeit online created a little app that he called Tinder for politics. It wasn't quite like Tinder because it asked people a series of questions about politics and then it matched them with their opposite and asked them if they'd like to meet. They were amazed that thousands did want to meet and even more amazed by the outcome. 94% enjoyed the experience. Of the 6% who didn't, it was mostly because their counterpart had failed to turn up. People had learned from each other. Many had changed their minds. Some even got married. Leadership requires the capacity to believe that people can talk, argue, debate, and learn. It requires trust in that process, and it resists outsourcing the difficult emotions involved to mere data gathering. It recognizes that collective intelligence, the ability to make good decisions together, depends on developing social capital, knowing each other, developing trust, learning how to listen and even look for all the information and life experiences one does not have oneself. This is as true in business as it is in politics. It's the reason why many companies as different as HSBC, Philips, Pixar, and Microsoft have developed various different forms of open strategy. Processes where huge parts, sometimes even all of the company, are involved in exploring strategic options. It's done with structure, with a lot of attention to detail. It is not just chat, but it's driven by two considerations. First, that often the best ideas come from people working outside their domain expertise because they can reframe the problem and identify different approaches. It doesn't deny the importance of expertise but seeks to add to it. And second, that those who participate in making the future have much more motive and knowledge with which to support it. That shouldn't be taken for granted by leaders, though it often is. You only need to look at unionizing in, Go in Google to see how easily legitimacy can slip from fingers of leaders 
too convinced that they know best. In whose name are these decisions being made? Is the question Google's well-off workforce is asking about their company's strategy. Identity in their minds has become part of the social contract. Deliberative processes like citizens' assemblies and indeed unions speak to this growing demand for legitimacy as derived from participation, not just institutional power. In my opinion, this matters even more post-pandemic when we've seen how many companies and organizations were dependent on the commitment and energy of some of their lowliest and least paid employees. Deliberative processes acknowledge that interdependence. Now, of course, this broadening of participation is not a substitute for decision-making. The essential work of leaders in Ireland, the citizens' assemblies advise parliament. They don't make the decisions. In open strategy, groups make recommendations to the board or to the executive committees. In some organizations, I'm starting to see the emergence of shadow boards. These are made up of younger generations, demographically representative, who can make recommendations to the governing bodies of their companies. And it speaks to the need for intergenerational participation that Professor John refer referenced. What all of these manifestations of leadership do is acknowledge that in a complex world, a VUCA world, it is impossible to know enough or to see enough. That working towards a better future requires huge amounts of imagination and creativity, not to be willfully blind, to emerging issues and to find the right processes for addressing problems. That working collaboratively with as diverse a range of people, experience, know-how produces more and better options than even the best and the brightest. And that working together both drives knowledge and insight across the entire organization or as in Ireland, across the entire country. That in turn leads to what I think of as the definition of a good decision, decisions that can be explained and understood without which they don't work. And all of these things together bring to decisions a legitimacy without which a society can begin to fracture. I want to close with three last quick thoughts. First, in the work I do with business leaders, I'm very struck by how busy they are. Long days, an impossible to-do list, a sense of always being on the run. That kind of goes with the territory. But what concerns me is that in their desire to run as fast as time, many of them have lost the ability to think, to spend time alone, having, as Hannah Arendt would say, a conversation with themselves. This is, of course, what they are paid to do and the one thing they struggle with most. Listening to the peripheral thoughts at the edge of their minds. This is what artists do all the time. It's why they're frequently ahead. And it's why the experience of creative work is, I think, essential to leadership development. Second, in Robert Putnam's most recent book, The Upswing, which looks at how America changed course between 1880 and the present, he finds that leadership is a lagging indicator, that change started at the grassroots way before leadership responded to it. It's a really provocative thought that leaders are often behind until they start to listen hard. And very often, as we've seen, it takes activists to bring them up to date. That's another lesson to be taken 
from the Citizens Assembly. Finally, one of the many things I love about scenario planning is that in the construction of multiple scenarios lies an acceptance of uncertainty, knowing we do not know the future. That's why creativity is so important to imagine what isn't there and why the power of convening is essential to gather, inform, co-create and learn together what is going to exper be experienced together. The heart and soul of the social contract is the heart and soul of leadership. The faith that we can do more together and better than anything we can make alone. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Heffernan, for that tour de force on leadership. I think what's uh, quite special about what you presented is that you believe leaders are those who um, have faith and trust in empowering citizens to be adults, to have the experience, the expertise, the ground feel, and even the sensing of emerging trends uh, to inform leadership and better decision making. But the second point is that that then means that leaders also have to invest in a process that allows for citizens to uh, come together either among themselves to collab, to convene, share and collaborate, or to do so and advise as was the case with Citizen Assembly on Abortion Parliament and let the leaders then respond to that. And the third uh, point uh, that you have made is actually at uh, the personal and individual level that leaders, you said, have been too busy to actually take the time to think, which is what they're paid for. And uh, that you uh, recognize that actually they need time to listen to some of the peripheral thoughts on the edge of their minds in order to generate what is creative, what is different, or to really uh, uh, create uh, something that is like the artists do something that's emergent and uh, um, respond possibly to complex issues, but also take the world on a different tilt if they just took the time. So thank you for that, Professor Hefnan. And now leaves me to introduce our two very distinguished discussants. They will be responding to what they've heard from Professor Chan and Professor Hefnan, and they are deep rooted within the community, within Singapore community. The first is, of course, uh, Mr. Han Fuk Kwang, who is one of the most distinguished journalists in Singapore, editor at large of Singapore's main English broadsheet, The Straits Times, and senior fellow at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies at the Nanyang Technological University. Mr. Han has co-authored several books on Singapore's founding Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew, including Lee Kuan Yew, The Man and His Ideas, Hard Truths to Keep Singapore Going, and One Man's View of the World. Um, he has uh, actually written several articles now uh, on the nature of Singapore's fourth generation leaders. So still deeply interested in the uh, quality of leadership in Singapore and continuing to contribute his thoughts on the matter. Mr. Han, maybe invite you to give us your thoughts on what Professor Chan and Professor Hefnan has said, and also what yourself, you yourself would like to contribute and add to this uh, discussion. Mr. Han, it's over to you and you have five minutes. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, Jillian. Uh, wonderful to be here. Uh, I think both speakers, Professor Chan Heng Chi and Professor Hefnan have framed the leadership issues very well. And I don't uh, disagree with any of the points they made. Uh, I like uh, Heng Chi's uh, three points about uh, the leadership issues that are relevant to Singapore, particularly her point about uh, uh, developing this uh, culture of uh, daring to try, which I think is especially relevant to Singapore. Uh, I think any leader that is able to do that deserves a, a gold medal. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure we are, we are there yet. I also like uh, Professor Hefferman's uh, 
uh, very, very insightful uh, comments about uh, the relationship between leaders and, and the people and how important it is to, to build this, uh, 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 to, to build trust between, between leaders and the people and that, and that uh, it is the, 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 the social contract between leaders and the people, which is you know, at the heart of, of uh, leadership. And I, I think I shall be talking a bit about that as well. You know, this question about leadership, I think, has a special place in Singapore, not because Singapore is a special country or our, our leaders are special, but because of the constant refrain since uh, independence, since day one of independence, that Singapore is highly dependent on good, strong leadership. Uh, and that without good, strong leadership, we will not even survive. I know it's like uh, air or, or water. And this was... This has resulted in a certain expectation of the people about uh, their leaders, about you know, the qualities and, and values of the leadership, uh, an expectation that was formed very early on uh, during the early years of, of independence. Uh, you know, many of our founding leaders are obviously very competent uh, and uh, their policies have obviously been very effective in uh, helping Singapore go from third world to the global city it is today. But I believe that uh, it was their values that, that were decisive. Uh, and the leadership was values driven. They believe very strongly in certain principles, including meritocracy, rule of law, zero tolerance for corruption and equality among the races. Values at that time informed policy. It was values first, then policy. And if you look at some of the successful policies that were implemented, I think you, you can see what I mean. Take public housing, for example. So it's not just about physically building housing estates and trying to house you know, almost the entire population, but the belief, the very strong belief that if everyone owns his home, it will increase his stake in the country. And more importantly, his stake in the future of the country. But homeowners are also expected to pay for their flat. And this was founded in the very important principle that uh, nobody owes you a living and you have to be responsible for your own upkeep. And I think the reason why leaders at that time were so effective and were seen to be good leaders worthy of the people's respect was because I think people understand values uh, more than they understand policy. You know, so people understand what meritocracy is all about, that nobody owes you a living. And as a result of that very deep understanding, uh, there, there was a connection with the leaders because people knew what they stood for. And that connection, I believe, can be made only through moral leadership that is values driven, not through policy. I also believe it is the same today, even though it is a completely different world. In fact, I would argue that it is even more important because it is a noisier world. And this is the second point I want to make. You know, we, we all know it is noisier because of the internet and social media, and there's so many competing voices. So what differentiates someone from another and the rest of the 1,000 other voices there are? How does the leader stand out in the crowd and win the respect? I think he stands out if people see him as a real person with feelings and emotions, with strong conviction about what he believes in, who keeps his words and is seen as one, one with the people, not somebody who is aloof and, and detached. And I think these are exactly the same qualities which mattered before. You know, the problem with the digital world uh, is that uh, with all the tools available to the leader, you know, through social media, videos, all the glitzy stuff that might help him spread the message, but they can detract from the most important thing, which is to make the leader human in the eyes of the people, someone real who can make an emotional connection with them. It is not about the message, but the person. Who is this person who is their leader? So I believe leadership is less about competence than it is about character and morality. Of course, competence is important and results must bear this out but competence can also be delivered by paid professionals, by civil servants and a professionally run civil service. But moral leadership is something else. It's about inspiring leadership, about shaping attitudes and behavior, about forging a sense of community 
and of a shared future. Is it more difficult to achieve this today than in the past? I think only if our leaders allow it to be so. And this is my uh, third point about the noisier world we live in and the role leaders have in this world. Because it is so noisy, I think there is a greater danger of leaders getting distracted by the noise and worse, pursuing the noisemakers unproductively. You know, you can have all the laws in the world to try to shut out that noise. And Singapore has introduced several, including a law we have, which we call POFMA. But you must be clear what is it you want to achieve that will be long lasting and worth the effort. If I could cite just one example from the past, you know, Singapore in its early days of independence also faced much misinformation from across the causeway, arising out of the quarrelsome circumstances of its separation with Malaysia. Malay language newspapers up north frequently carried anti-Singapore news and commentaries. How did our founding leaders, especially Lee Kuan Yew, deal with them? I think his approach was counterintuitive. He did not censor them or shut them out from the Singaporean audience. Instead, he encouraged Singapore newspapers to publish these anti-Singapore commentaries from Utusan Malaya, which is the main Malay newspaper in Malaysia, because he wanted Singaporeans to know what they were doing to harm Singapore. On our own, you know, the Straits Times, which is the main English language newspaper here, would have ignored these commentaries because they were so one-sided un one and unworthy of publications. But Mr. Lee saw it completely differently. He saw it as an opportunity to educate Singaporeans on what was happening across the causeway and what these ultra Malays were, were doing. That to him, was more important than the risk that some Singaporeans may unwittingly believe in the Malaysian propaganda. I think this requires great clarity of thinking about what the crux of the issue was. So it wasn't about rebutting those issues, those, those views and shutting them out. That's all peripheral to the main issue. And if you pursue them, then you might be blown off course. So I'm raising this not to revisit the past, but because I believe that in the new world, this globalized and very digitally connected world, there are many distractions that leaders are faced with, you know, fueled by social media, even mainstream media. And if you follow what is generating the most interest or trending, you can get and often do get blown off course. And in such an environment, leaders have to be very clear headed and even single minded about what the most important issues are. So I think I'll stop here and I, I can elaborate on some of the points, hopefully during q and Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Han, for that intervention and, uh, um, you know, appreciate how you are um, referencing our own political history again and uh, cited how Singaporeans were won over by values much more than policy. They understand values more than they do policy and they should be addressed through values than the detail or the minutiae of policies. People want to know why uh, the policies are being introduced or implemented. Second, that you said that uh, in a noisier world, what will matter again are those values and sense of morality than just a mere competence because Competence can be delivered by civil servants. Uh, there's a technical part of it rather than just uh, the uh, why, the values of, behind the policies. And finally, in a noisier world in terms of media and information, uh, leaders have to be clear-headed and uh, single-minded in discerning what is the most important uh, message that should go through. And in fact, sometimes these can be quite counterintuitive for a larger national or strategic purpose. So thank you for that. And finally, last but not least, please allow me to introduce a very important community leader in Singapore, and that is uh, none other than Ms. Zuraida Abdullah. Ms. Zuraida Abdullah has a distinguished record of public service. She uh, is Singapore's first woman to become Senior Assistant Commissioner of the Singapore Police Force. Uh, after her retirement from SPF, she has now been appointed the CEO of uh, Mundaki, which is a self-help group 
uh, for the Malay Muslims in Singapore. She is the recipient of very many national awards for her leadership. And I think without further ado, please allow me to uh, pass the time over to you, Ms. Zuraida. You have five minutes to share with us your take on what you have heard. Thank you, Julian, and thank you too to Ambassador Chan, Professor Hefner, and, and Mr. Han for your sharing. Uh, I would like to start first by uh, building on Ambassador Chan's point about being bold and instilling a culture of daring to try in our leaders. Now, I agree with her fully, and, and given that we are operating in the VUCA environments now, we need leaders who can be bold and who dare to try. Now, in fact, this is consistent with the uh, report by the conference board uh, global leadership uh, forecast in 2014 and 2015, uh, in which it says that uh, VUCA uh, ready leaders are those who can first anticipate and react to the nature and the speed of change, who can act decisively without always having clear SOPs or directions and no certainties. Uh, one who can navigate through complexity, chaos and confusions, and also one that who can maintain effectiveness despite constant surprises and lack of predictability. Now, apart from all these uh, qualities, I am also of the view that first and foremost, the VUCA ready leaders must also be comfortable uh, operating in such an environment. You can't have people who, who cannot deal with chaos and who cannot work with chaos. Uh, now, while he or the leaders for the future is a risk taker, the last thing we want to do is to have someone who's a kama, kamikaze leaders. Uh, so firstly, yeah, I would like to look at it uh, Ambassador was, uh, Chan was asking, so where can we get such leaders? And well, I suggest that we look first at our youth and uh, because they are going to be the future leaders. And we currently as the leaders asking how can we help them develop these qualities and so that they can be ready in the next decades and beyond. What kind of environments must we create and expose them to so that they are not risk averse and dare to try. Uh, now, if I can borrow the metaphor used by Senior Minister Tarmand during the interview in May 2015 at the St. Gallen Symposium in Switzerland, uh, can we provide a trampoline, not a safety net for them to bounce and climb higher when they fail or fall? Uh, but that doesn't mean getting them to keep bouncing endlessly. Now, secondly, a society too must play an important role to providing an appropriate environment for such leaders to thrive. And as such, I thought that we should not just focus about what kind of leaders we need, but what kind of society we need that will enable such leaders to thrive. Now, in this case itself, I think that we need to relook at how we see fail experiences, uh, experiences and Think of them as learning points. Now, Han mentioned about the, the, the history about how leaders, our leaders then, uh, and there are learning points as well from that. Uh, Professor Hafton and as well mentioned, how can we learn? How can we shape that society that we want? It's not just about leaders respecting the citizens, but also society respecting views of uh, divergent views on the ground. And how can we identify individuals who fail as risk takers and not failures? Now, um, I, I think this is something in which Singapore society particularly, we can do better in these areas. We should not be quick to condemn leaders who make mistakes, uh, even after they have acknowledged the failures courageously and quickly. And, 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 and if we do that, then we were not going to see that many leaders here. Thirdly, uh, I think that as leaders, do we also walk the talk and consciously recruit someone who had failed before and bounced back? Or do we simply recruit someone who has succeeded all his life? Do we, in the job descriptions, identify qualities that we look for in a recruit as someone who has a degree? Or do we do it the opposite? Like, do we look for qualities of someone who dares to drive? to try kind of attitude and had experienced failure. I think this is very important because if someone who has experienced failures, they are more likely to be prepared for setbacks and more likely to be prepared for it psychologically. They do not simply quit. Instead, they adapt and try again. Uh, we must remember that 
success is not the path to learning, but learning is. Now, we also must all change or shift the mindset of parents and encourage risk-taking even at the family level. Now, as parents, uh, we must move away from the traditional expectation of wanting our, our kids to be doctors, uh, lawyers, and engineers. And you can see that these are, are not the great, not like what Professor Hefton mentioned is about, do we need more artists who's more creative? This is, these are, if you look at, uh, as an engineer, there's a certain set of SOPs that we follow. So if we, but instead, uh, do we uh, respect kids, youth who aspire to be founders of the startup and even encourage that in the next generations? Now, I believe that these are the qualities that we should instill in our young so that they can be VUCA ready leaders. And finally, I believe that we need to develop leaders at all levels, not just the top echelon. This, I think, will help eventually develop, produce leaders from among the different segments of the society. And in turn, we will then have an opportunity to form leadership group that is multicultural and intergenerational, uh, generational, that embraces diversity and demonstrate empathy and insight of the society that they serve. And here I believe very strongly in mentoring to inspire younger future leaders and help develop their leadership's qualities and values that will serve as their compass in making good decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Zoraida. Thank you for uh, the four key points that you shared. First, that uh, uh, on the question of where to find leaders in Singapore, look to the youth um, and uh, where, where are they? Well, there are those who uh, should be developed um, and uh, will be helped in the process by us being able to articulate what are our needs. And tied to that is your final point about mentorship. I guess we mentor young leaders, but we should also, as you said, mentor leaders from all levels and across society so that uh, the leadership core is diverse in itself and can have empathy for a diverse society, a point that Prof Chan has made. Uh, you also said that, uh, uh, do we look for leaders among those who have uh, the credentials and who are the winners? Or should they uh, be spotted among those who have tried, who have the daring do, uh, may have failed, but have, pro have the proven quality of being able to pick themselves up and bounce back again. And finally, that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, to reinforce the point that uh, you have to um, see if society itself is prepared to host, to identify, to throw up people like themselves who have failed in the past, but then we've demonstrated that quality of leadership. So thank you for that. And I think we quickly move into uh, the question and answer session because we've got a lively uh, platform here on Pigeonhole. Um, I think our audience knows that uh, this is the platform that uh, they can go to to share their points of view. Uh, now I'm torn between two questions. Uh, um, they're not uh, unrelated, but let me go uh, to these two questions and uh, pose them to you and you're welcome to respond as you wish panelists. First, how should Singapore leaders strike the balance between engagement and listening to the population and then making difficult decisions that may not please everybody? I think Professor Hefnan, you discussed the uh, occasion of the deliberation that took place on abortion and that because of the process, even though 64, 67% of uh, supported abortion in the referendum, the other group that did not uh, feel satisfied by the referendum still recognized the legitimacy of that decision because of the process. Would you like to say more uh, and especially tied around the second question, which is in a noisier world might be more important for leaders to listen to the oppressed. How can we create space for oppressed voices and engage in deliberative democracy. So I'd ask Prof Heffernan to kick off and explicate further on uh, the uh, anecdote she opened with, and then over to uh, Prof Chan, Prof Hing, uh, 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 and uh, Ms. Zuraida, because you know the situation in Singapore 
we're trying to move into the culture of del deliberative democracy. Um, how will it work? And is it about then pleasing everybody? What about the oppressed and the marginalized who may find it difficult to articulate their concerns? What about them? So over to Prof Hefnan, then Chan Heng Chi, Han Fu Kuang, and Mr. Ryder. Thanks, Jillian. I think one of the things that's really very impressive about um, the various examples of deliberative democracy that I know about is that because the groups doing the deliberation are designed to be a kind of demographic reflection of the society, um, they, they necessarily include the voices and much more important, the lived experience of the oppressed as long as others. I think um, trying to create institutions specifically for the oppressed backfires pretty spectacularly. And, you know, what becomes most crucial is not just who's speaking, but who's listening. So that there's an understanding that actually every group in society has a great deal to learn about every other group. Um, I would also say, having talked to many of the civil servants who were involved in managing the Citizens' Assembly, that they were extremely vigilant in ensuring that all voices were heard, in paying attention to people who were silent in discussion sessions and bringing them out, in making sure that everybody had had an opportunity to ask the questions that were on their minds and had understood everything that they'd been told. And any question they had, anything they didn't understand, the civil servants followed up on until they were sure that the understanding was clear. I mean, it was really an extraordinarily beautifully produced, um, careful exercise um, overseen by a judge who was really obsessed with transparency, that everything should be seen as having been done in a wholly legitimate way. And so I think, um, in, I think that, you know, the detail and the meticulousness with which it was done was probably as important as the fact that it was done. Um, I think also one of the other things that emerged from the process was a sense that, um, that you make decisions for now, which may be changed subsequently. I mean, some of the people I talked to who weren't happy with the outcome said, well, you know, 20, 30 years from now, we may revisit this and we may come to a different decision. Um, so there was a sort of understanding about the degree to which, it, per, to which social opinions shift and may shift over time, that they're not written forever um, but that they definitely have to reflect the society that's implementing them. So, um, so I think that mattered a very great deal, but mostly I think what mattered was this sense that all voices had been heard, that all voices had been welcome, um, and also that enough time was given to it. So it's, it was quite an interesting thing because there was, I think, a public recognition that the process did not favor one position over another or one voice over another. You know, it was young and old, it was male and female, it was um, in the different permutations of um, sexual preferences. So it really, you know, they really did go to a, a huge amount of time and trouble and effort to ensure that it felt like a truly representative thing. And I would say, and I'm sure many people in the audience are familiar with this, but you know, this is, we've been doing these kinds of exercises in different parts of the world since about 1998. And whether it's to do with city budgeting or um, climate change uh, regulations, you know, they do see, the process does seem to have this capacity when exercise, you know, when done well to bestow legitimacy on decisions, which otherwise, you know, often are rejected, not even so much because they're the wrong decisions, but because the wrong process led to them. And I think this issue of legitimacy is really fundamental to leadership, which is not just making decisions. And, you know, to previous speakers, not even attempting the notion of a perfect decision but aiming at a decision 
that can be explained. We know how we got here. We think the process was legitimate. And therefore, even if we don't like it, we can accept it. Thank you. Prof Chan? Well, how do you strike a balance between engagement and making decisions that are difficult? I think in Singapore, our culture seems to be that, you know, leaders must make difficult decisions. Yes, they must make difficult decisions, but making difficult decisions isn't the only measure. Ability to make difficult decisions is not the only measure of leadership. I think uh, we've seen this happen. It's... Um, I heard Professor uh, Margaret Heffernan talk about this process in, uh, I think it is Ireland, you know, it's uh, a beautiful process. And he, she kept using the word, the time, the transparency, you listen to everybody. And I think it is, well, to make a decision like that, you really have to put in the time. And I think in a decision on abortion, on values, uh, leaderships tend, governments tend to give a bit more uh, time for this to play out. I recall that when we had a bill on abortion, it was, I think the whip was also lifted, you know. So when it's a matter of conscience, you know, leaderships know where they have to really, uh, where they cannot push. So, yes, I think um, you can make decisions to improving the process, allowing time, allowing for discussion. And I, in Singapore, we probably, we try this, it's slightly different, you know, because the participation also, people are only beginning to warm up to it now, you know, and uh, it wasn't so before, but I'm hopeful it will be more deliberative democracy, participatory democracy. Is very new, you know, and I think when they try these conversations uh, in the neighborhood, what do you want to do, for instance, with this uh, garden, this plot of land? How do you, HDB says, how do you want to plan this garden? You are going to have many different voices. How do you come up to one decision? We are learning this. Have we seen instances of the balance of engagement and making difficult decisions? I will have to say, I go back to watching Lee Kuan Yew on the tape. When he was engaging, mind you, he was engaging the Pilots Association. I saw a YouTube about this and explaining very difficult, a very difficult decision to them about, you know, uh, pay cuts and so on and preserving jobs. He listened to them, he engaged them, but he knew what he wanted to say. And he had to make this diff difficult decision. He carried it off. For Kwang will say is the moral leader, you know, the authority, perhaps. But he was able to carry this, you know. Um, so how do politicians do it? And how do they do it in different cultures? And how do you do it in a Singapore culture? And I would say right now, our leaders, this generation, you know, uh, Prime Minister Lee, 4G and so on, they are trying participatory, uh, you know, democracy, some level of participation in invitation to participate and beginning to sort out the noises and to try to find consensus. And people are beginning to understand too that, you know, what you want, two other neighbors may not want the same thing and you can have to, you have to negotiate and bargain. So we learn in the process, you okay. know. So Prof Chan, Rebecca, yeah. yes. Prof Chan, Rebecca has actually brought up the issue of LGBT rights. So right. do you care to apply uh, what you just said to that issue that you brought up in your uh, uh, spoken remarks uh, earlier? Uh, uh, LGBT uh, akin to abortion are uh, within the realm of cultural wars, actually. So do you see that society or state should lead or do you feel that uh, Singapore is ready uh, for a deliberative process on the issue of LGBT rights and more pointedly 377A on our statutes? There's been a debate on this, you know, there's a government point of view that, you know, they are open, but they will follow society. I think this is our uh, government's position now. Uh, they will, you know, they will live and let live, let be. 
And yeah. uh, I understand LGBT, the community would want a stronger position because it is about the legitimacy of their status and their rights. And I've talked to many of them because I, you know, I was a human rights envoy for many years and I have dialogue with the CSOs and I understand where they come from too, you know. So uh, what do we do here? Now, when Margaret uh, spoke about Germany, this uh, desert uh, experiment of bringing people of opposing views together and whether they can persuade each other, you could try it. I don't know whether you will persuade people because, you know, this is, there, there's a religious element to the position. So that's also very sensitive. We can try that, but I don't think it is, uh, how it will turn out, I will be interested. Uh, should government lead the issue or should they follow the issue? I would say I lean on the side of leading the issue, but then I'm not in government, you know, and I say this. Um, so uh, I think um, this is, uh, it is a difficult issue. Should the vote be lifted on this? Is this conscious? I think if the vote is lifted, you, you may not even see the outcome that you, the LGBT may want, community may want, you know, I think. Right. So, Thank you. Uh, but yeah. I, I want to make one more point, um, uh, Gillian. I always feel it a compliment when my students or my colleagues come and tell me that when they leave that, you know, they felt I gave them tough love. <laughs> now, I think the balance of engagement and making difficult decisions has something to do with that. You know, you listen, but you must know when to, you know, you know something you have to do, you try to take in their views and adjust if you can. But in the end, if you have to take a difficult decision, you tell them why you do it, you know. But it doesn't mean you always have to take that tough decision, you know. Sometimes they are right and you have to change your own decision too. And I think in doing that, when leaders can do that and you show that you change your decision because you've engaged with the people, you strengthen your legitimacy. And I think that's very important. Thank you for that point. Over to Mr. Han, please. Yes, well, you know, this uh, balance between uh, listening and, 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 and implementing tough decisions, it's an evergreen question, isn't it? It keeps popping up, yeah. uh, you know, and uh, uh, over the years, there's been a fair amount of skepticism, you know, is the over, over the government's uh, approach to it. You know, people wonder, is the government really listening or has it already, you know, formed its, uh, made up its mind and, and it's just going through the motion? I suppose to be fair to the government, it is listening a lot more than it used to be uh, in, in the 1960s and 70s where decisions were, were really made uh, uh, in, in, a, in a very one-sided uh, manner. Uh, I think part of the problem in Singapore, and maybe it's uniquely uh, the case here, is that because the government has been in power for so long, you know, more than 50 years in power, uh, probably quite, quite unheard of in many other countries, I think it tends to be a little bit defensive about its policies, you know, because you know it's 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 uh, originated those policies, it's implemented it, it's uh, it, it owns those policies. So uh, there, there is a certain amount of, of defensiveness uh, uh, about it, and I, I think I suppose it, it it will require a fair amount of fairly heroic and, and superhuman effort to 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 try to get it to. Uh, to, to, to change. Uh, uh, many, many uh, speakers have spoken about uh, the, the very uncertain, very new world that we are in and question whether uh, the old formula will continue to work. Uh, so I, I think this is, this is, this, this is a very uh, important and, and critical question for Singapore. I have just one small little suggestion. Uh, to make, uh, I think it's not a question of listening to the broad, you know, large masses of people out there. Uh, you know, we operate a system where uh, the government appoints very many uh, so-called thought leaders and leaders of industry and, and, and in the respective field to, 
into into positions of some some authority, you know, statutory boards, review committees, and so on. And I and I feel that the government should broaden its pool of the pool of people in which it, it draws on. Uh, and I think the criticism ha has been that it, you see the same old familiar faces uh, in, in 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 these setups. And I no doubt that many of them are very competent and very experienced. But there's something to be said about going beyond, you know, the the, the, the usual list of suspects, as it were. And I, I would say that's one of the small little, you know, steps that the government can make uh, to 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 in, in this in this thing about, you know, engaging and, and listening to people. Thank you, Mr. Han. Over to Ms. Ryder. Your take, please. Uh, my take is that uh, the key to uh, strike a balance is in terms of the process. And in, when we talk about the process in terms of providing opportunities and getting as many people and also be brave to listen to topics that we have, you know, like it's going to be a difficult topics. And in fact, as a leader, you expect to make difficult decision. And the last thing you want to do is to make decision just because you want to get the uh, popularity contest kind of thing. That's, that's not what leaders are, right? And, and in this regard, uh, I agree that the governments are doing a, a lot more. Uh, the recent em, uh, emerging stronger conversation is another good example. But what we should be looking at is that uh, you know, Prof, uh, Ambassador Chan mentioned that if you look at the Instagram, the youth are talking a lot about issues, anti-racism and so forth. These are issues that I don't think so are noises. If they are, then we can ignore them. But if they are not, then we must be bold enough and dare to discuss about it and provide the right platform to discuss about it. And as many people in the spectrum of the society that needs to be welcome to discuss. And I think a human being are very logical. I mean, if you let them be heard, they listen. They just like uh, uh, Professor Hafen mentioned about the issues of abortion. But when you allow and people recognize that they give an opportunity to speak up, then they will, they will understand. And even though you make the the the, the, the decision that is not going to please anybody, those people agree why those decisions has got to be made. And uh, really, it's about process. Uh, it's about being bold enough to discuss issues rather than letting it, you know, discuss in the social medias and ignoring. I think that's not what they should be doing, right? To, to, to take it there and discuss about it. And of course, a good facilitation is needed. <laughs> right. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm going to quickly cast out, out, uh, out your attention to uh, the next question, uh, which had 24 votes. I don't know where it is now. But basically, uh, a question about how you would engage the millennials who uh, come across as a different breed of citizen than the middle aged and the seniors. In a way, uh, Prof Chan, you uh, uh, addressed the issue of intergenerational engagement. Um, but uh, in addition to that, there's another question about how, um, even as we speak about diversities, we tend to put people in boxes. You represent this set of, uh, this social identity and you represent the opposite. Um, how then are we gonna go forward if um, the chaos and the uncertainty really unmoors us from these concepts um, through diverse diversity? So, over to any of you, or Prof. Heffernan, you can kick off if you like, uh, or Mr. Ryder, you talked about youth, intergenerational dialogue, but then who's old and who's young? <laughs> no, oh, sorry. Prof. Chan, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> I, you know, um, uh, if I may just be brief about this. Yes. You know, Jillian, you talk about how do we reconcile and how do we make them one? Millennials will think like millennials and they have their interests and, you know, they have different aspirations. The middle age have different aspirations and the seniors have different aspirations. You can't just make them into one, you know, you can't bake them into one cake. Okay. So I think you just have to un leave space and allow this. They won't be siloed, but you have to allow these uh, different identities and interests to express themselves. Thank you. Over to Prof. Hefner. 
So I, I completely agree. I mean, I think all of us have multiple identities. You know, am I a business person? Am I a writer? Am I a mother? Um, you know, I sit on my local village council. Does that mean I'm a counselor? Um, you know, and my views are not necessarily the views of other people in my demographic. So I think we have to be super wary of this notion that um, I am defined by the data points uh, that people immediately see about me. I thought um, uh, Professor Chun's argument about intergenerational um, participation was absolutely spot on. And I'm very struck that the millennial generation, it seems to me to be uh, much more focused on justice and so social justice. And this is certainly one reason why a number of organizations I work with have started setting up these shadow boards which is they recognize that by the time you get to the level of an executive committee or a board of a company, uh, you tend to be of a certain age, you had tend to have a certain background, you tend to have a certain income, which changes the way that you see things. And these shadow boards are quite interesting because they're certainly about the best business and management education tool I have ever seen. Um, but they provide insight and different perspectives of the kind that the board absolutely does not have. And, um, and I think they're an incredibly positive thing and actually much more effective than something I've also seen companies do, which is to put one young person on the official board. One young person uh, is almost as unhelpful as putting one young, one woman or one, yeah. um, one particular representation of a group, which you know, A, they have no power, and B, it's absurd to think that they can represent all of their group. But I do think that increasingly, as we are making decisions which have very long-term consequences, uh, enlisting the engagement and participation of the people who are going to live with those consequences, consequences is essential. And I would just cite as one very interesting example um, here in the UK, in Wales, they have created a commissioner for future generations. And this is an office and an individual responsible for analyzing all government spending and decision-making in terms of its consequences for children not yet born. This is a radically different lens through which to assess decision-making. And, um, and to date, you know, and of course everything can always change, um, but to date it's done two really smart things, which is it's definitely changed the way that political leaders have to think about their decisions because they know they're going to be assessed through this lens. And it has led to a very uh, wide public conversation, if you like, about um, decisions seen through a very different perspective. Not so much, is this gonna be good for me to have a tax cut or a new road, but what are, the con what are my children gonna pay for this? Because we've seen governments quite happy to sign up for projects which actually they're not going to pay for, their children and their children's children are going to pay for. And it's changed the many of the decisions that are being made. And it's changed the way that certain problems, healthcare being a classic one, are perceived. Thank you, Prof. Over to Mr. Han or Mr. Ryder. I personally like the idea of the shadow board. Uh, and in fact, that's one of the possibilities about providing a platform or creating a, the platform for the youth to come forward and, and speak up and, and say they may not be in a position to make the decisions, but their views can be heard by the main board and that can be taken into consideration. It also gives an avenue for the youth to, to say things and to recognize also, it's not just about speaking up, it's about accountabilities, about responsibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, I'll just, you know, uh, in Mandaki, we have a Mandaki club comprising the young peoples and we get them to talk about it. And from time to time, I speak to them, I engage them and listen to them. I may not have to agree with them, but at least I listen to them. And of course, if their ideas are fantastic, by all means, take it accept it and, and, and go with it. And uh, they should be involved in the decision making. They should, if we want to create future leaders tomorrow, and that's the platform that we need to create and allow that to speak up. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and don't just say, oh, they're the millennial. And, you know, I, I think we need to understand 
But of course, uh, I can't put me to mentor someone who's an 18 years old. They say, oh, you're too old. I can't understand. You don't understand me. So this is something in which we, we must recognize. There are people that when you go into conversation, sometimes you need to have the same group of people to understand. But it depends as well on the topic. Certain topics, you may have a composition of diff people from different, uh, different segments to, to right. have a holistic views of the issues. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Han. Yeah, so just very quickly. Uh, so I agree completely with uh, Prof Chan's uh, point about intergenerational leadership. Uh, and uh, just to sort of uh, make the point that, you know, the, the, uh, in Singapore, the template for leadership renewal uh, in, in, in the ruling party and, and therefore of the country is uh, sort of cohort uh, renewal. Uh, so a, a particular cohort belonging to a particular generation uh, takes over from uh, from an older cohort and an, and an older generation, and and the four, uh, sort of four G leaders are in their late are in their forties and then fifties now. Uh, I mean that has worked in the past. You know this was the way they inducted people, and then you know you need another, another ten to fifteen years in government, and then you are ready to assume leadership. But uh, in this uh, new world where you know you need to make the connections with the younger generation and things are moving so fast that one particular generation may be completely different from another generation. I wonder whether cohort renewal, although it has worked in the past, is necessarily uh, the, the right way to go into the future. Okay, thank you, Mr. Han. I think we are uh, six minutes uh, past five thirty, so uh, I think we should wrap up very soon. Let me do so by uh, inviting a rapid fire round of responses to these questions. Uh, feel free to take whichever one you, uh, um, whichever one resonates with you, okay? Uh, and give us your closing thoughts. Uh, the first question is um, about how, uh, you know, looking at the world, which needs good global leadership, how is this different from national leadership? Today, a good Chinese or US leader may not be widely accepted globally. So uh, there's global leadership and national leadership. And another question was that, then how should Singapore develop qualities of leaders who can not just play on the local stage, but also make uh, the contribution on the global stage that we, we Little Singapore does continue to uh, uh, invest ourselves as a member of the international community in good moral leadership that uh, contributes to human development. So how do we do that in Singapore? Uh, finally, uh, we're headed to a low growth world for a very long time. We just talked about the VUCA world with wicked problems. Uh, how, do we, uh, how do we have leaders or rather, or maybe even citizens who themselves are leaders in being able to galvanize each other to accept some sacrifices for the common good? I think this is also felt much, uh, very acutely with this COVID-19 pandemic. So just to round up your quick comments, uh, let me go the reverse order. Uh, Ms. Zoraida, uh, yeah, go ahead. And I, I, I take the response. last questions. I, I think that when you make decisions, when you have to make decisions, the, it's not about you, it's not about it. the larger picture, the larger purpose of it. Uh, that makes me recall when we had to close the mosque during the circuit breaker uh, at, for the Friday prayers. And, and that's something that is close to how hard. And how do the leaders communicate to them that, you know, yes, it's something that as a religion you have to do, but you need to also understand if you insist on doing so, then you are affecting the larger group, which is the safety of the others. So it, the, if you just uh, enlarge it from that, to the from the community of Malay Muslim to that of the national, and then the same thing to that at the global level. I think that will guide us in terms of uh, being a leader, not just for Singapore, but a leader at the national level. And I thought that's something in which we, we as a leader, we need to bear in mind. And that boils down to your purpose, why you exist and what you serve. And I think that's, that's my closing remark. Thank you. Start with purposeful leadership. Thank you, Mr. Ryder. Over to Mr. Han. Yeah, okay. I'll take the question about the, the role of the people uh, uh, on this issue. Uh, you know, I spoke about why leadership is such a special place in, in, in Singapore because of our history. 
you know, every country hopes its leaders will be good and strong men and women with high levels of integrity, commitment, and competence. But I think in many cases, this will happen, whether this will happen is more a result of good fortune than anything else. You know, good and bad leaders will come and go. And I, I, I suppose Singapore has been very fortunate that its founding leaders were really an outstanding group. Uh, but this stroke of good luck uh, may never be repeated. Uh, it's, it's also been said that, uh, you know, Singaporeans are overly dependent on, on the government to solve all their problems. Uh, and as a result, they have not developed uh, enough of the uh, societal instincts, if you want to call it that way, to solve problems on their own. Uh, in civil society, some people argue it's not as strong as in, in other countries. And I think this, this is a recipe for, for uh, potential problems because strong leadership can never be guaranteed. I think it's better to develop a culture amongst the people, to be self-reliant, to be self-starters, to develop the instincts to solve their problems collectively, to take ownership of their issues, then always to look towards the government uh, for strong you know, uh, leadership and, and help. And, and, and I, I would argue that a strong people with those qualities is the best safeguard against uh, weak leadership. Thank you. I'm sure it's a point that resonates with you, Prof Hefnan, your key message today. So over to you to pick up which question you'd like to respond to and give us your closing remarks. I think this question about how to galvanize an acceptance of sacrifice is really crucial. And I'm very grateful to whoever posed the question because I think that sacrifice has become a dirty word um, after generations focused on individualism. And I think it's in the nature of political institutions that there's always going to be a kind of shifting balance between personal rights and responsibilities versus collective rights and responsibilities. And you know, from my perspective, certainly in the West, we've gone pretty far overboard in terms of individualism and are now kind of clinging on to try to rectify this. There is no doubt in my mind that a no growth society or a period of time of a no growth society is going to require sacrifices of all of us. And I think if we want moral leadership, then we have to have leaders who are prepared to talk about the sacrifices, which on the whole, most leaders do not want to do and be prepared to explain what these sacrifices are for. Ultimately, I think if you try to sell the argument that we're gonna change a lot, but there are going to be no sacrifices, you're really treating people as children. All change involves sacrifice. You know, whether it's a small one, I want to lose weight, so I'm gonna to have to sacrifice, you know, fatty foods, or whether it's, um, you know, I want a big change in the economy, in which case I might have to accept higher taxes or lower wages or any number of things. So I think we have to have a very serious conversation about sacrifice on a level that I haven't actually seen anywhere. But the other thing which I think is really important is um, the, the shift, which I know a little bit about, I wouldn't pretend to have authoritative insight into this, but the shift which I perceive in terms of education um, in Singapore, among other places, um, shifting the emphasis from individual uh, its scores, grades, and so on, to a great deal more collaboration and teamwork. Um, I think these experiences, as they're kind of, if they go all the way through an educational process, from you know infant school to university, this experience of working in groups where sometimes I have to make a sacrifice in order that someone else have an opportunity to make a contribution. I think this is really fundamental. It can't start early enough. It can't be, I haven't seen a situation where it has been um, excessively introduced into education, but I think this early understanding that I can't thrive if others don't thrive. And others going, aren't going to thrive unless I thrive. I think this is something we have to implant deeply into our education systems. It, even though that means moving away from the things that really satisfy pushy parents, which are high, you know, high grades for my loved one. Thank you so much, uh, Prof Heffernan, for uh, reinforcing the point on values and actually uh, set, you've tipped the pyramid of authority uh, the other way around and you've sort of uh, now ended by starting right at the beginning. 
with children <laughs> and collaboration, uh, introducing that from young. So to close us off, finally, Prof Chan, may we have your points of view to uh, wrap right. the session. Very Thank good. you. Thank First you. of all, I want to thank Margaret Heffernan for mentioning that we really need a serious conversation on sacrifice. That's your next topic, IPS. We should discuss this. You know, and, and how to think of the way, uh, you know, citizens sacrifice, countries sacrifice, you know, and what is sacrifice is very important and how you collaborate as well, because sacrifice brings that. But the question that hasn't been answered, which I want to answer and pick to answer, is about global leadership, national leadership. And I think there was a bit in that question, uh, you know, uh, why is China not accepted as a global leader? Was that the question? Um, but go ahead, please. Yeah. Well, first of all, let me say that every global leader is a success at being a national leader. You cannot gain respect on the world stage if you were not domestically successful and doing a good job for your citizens. It's not just GDP, you know. I think the world can see, you know, uh, our country is doing well by their citizens. It's the economy, the distribution, equity issues, and what they've done in different areas. National uh, leadership, the, if you build up your country, uh, you strengthen the country, gives you a voice and a place on the stage. That is why Barack Obama once said that really the United States had to repair domestically, had to build up domestically so that you know, it can lead the world better. And Biden, Pre President Jackson Biden has said exactly that, build back better, start at home first before you can take strong leadership outside. And for uh, Singapore, I think we've been, uh, We've had a little toehold on the stage and a seat sometimes in a forum because people look at what has happened in Singapore. We've built up a good country, a successful country. People live well. There's development, so on and so forth. Now, China. I think we have to accept that in the world today, there's an ideological divide. It was there likely and in the last four years, President Trump has pushed that divide to be much clearer. And because of this divide, Western countries, and this includes Europe and so on, well, that affects how they accept who should be our leader. Now, China has done very well in China. China has done very well in the eyes of so many countries, including the West, because now they see how China has handled COVID. But I think to accept the global leadership of China, they want to see what values, what shared values on the global stage, rules-based society, you know, the rules-based order and so on. So there's further negotiation. Same with Russia. Can, but if China becomes really big as a country, really powerful, ahead of everybody, street heads and shoulders, willy-nilly, people will look to them as a leader. And you can have leadership in different areas, global leadership, even technology, pharmaceuticals, you know, uh, and whether it is in health, in the your economic ideas, governance ideas, you know, and but because of that ideological divide, I think, you know, you accept some things, you don't accept some things. So I better add just that. <laughs> Thank you, Prof Chan. I think the audience would agree and please go to the conference chat site to share uh, that, uh, you know, we've really had a very rich discussion. Um, mm -hmm. We're talking about Singapore and there's a sense, I think, consensus in the room that we are trying to morph uh, into a different model of democracy, a deliberative democracy. I think Prof Heffernan offered us some inspiring examples, but also ideas like shadow boards, conference of the future gen committees on the future generation to push that. And uh, Mr. Ryder uh, shared that she's also been trying this out in Mandaki. Uh, Mr. Han has uh, emphasized what are the, some of the barriers or actually, uh, you know, the, the problems of our success in, in wanting to move to new paradigms. Um, and I think certainly we'll have to discuss that. And Prof Chan uh, really uh, made it painful for us to talk about uh, really the sacrifices, the hard choices 
that are before uh, our leaders as we go through this uh, difficult period in global history. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank on the audience behalf, our panelists this afternoon. Uh, thank you also audience for all your comments and questions. Please continue to share your comments uh, on this topic in the conference chat. We're going to take this on board for our plenary session on the 25th of January and also feed this into our scenario planning project called Reimagining Singapore 2030. This session has been recorded, so if you missed anything, feel free to just review it at any time. And before our break, I would plead with you to join us for the last of the purely online sessions of the conference not to be missed because it is really, uh, uh, in addition to the, this session, digital. It's really about understanding the global trends, social movements, and their impact on democracy, brackets, democratic deconsolidation that we're seeing in the world today. We're trying to beat the trend in Singapore uh, Margaret Heffernan's talked about how people are doing it for themselves, but there are people doing it for themselves in a different way and trying to break the models where they've not uh, worked. So please join us in session chaired by Ho Kwon Ping. The speakers are Dr. Robert Foa, who's at the Center for Future of Democracy, Bennett Institute of Public Policy, University of Cambridge. Our very own Dr. Terence Chong, who's Deputy Director at ISIS Yusuf Ishak Institute. The discussants are Mr. Aaron Maniam, Deputy Secretary at the Ministry of Communications and Information, but more loved as one of our poets in Singapore, and Ms. Zuraida Ibrahim, who is Deputy Executive Editor of the South China Morning Post, who's had front row seat in uh, um, 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 the convulsions that we see in terms of governance in Asia. Join us at 8 p.m. Thank you very much indeed and have a good evening.